Welcome, welcome. Come on in. This is the session on artificial intelligence and robots, economy of the future or the end of the world. <laughs> <laughs> I am Michael Shermer, the publisher of this magazine, Skeptic Magazine, and a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and I'm a presidential fellow at Chapman University, and I am the host of this particular session. Uh, just by chance, Ed happened to have a copy of my own magazine, thank you, Ed, uh, in which we, our cover story is on this very subject, Could Artificial Superintelligence Destroy Us? Uh, I'm not going to comment at all because we have five panelists today, so let me introduce them as quickly as possible, and then we will get started, uh, because they all have plenty of interesting things to say. Dr. Ed Hudgens will be going first. He's a research director at the Heartland Institute which seeks to develop and promote free market solutions to social and economic problems. Hudgens has written extensively on the promise of exponential technologies and the need for human achievement and entrepreneurial ethos. Before joining Heartland, he worked at the Atlas Society, which promotes the philosophy of reason, freedom, and individualism as developed by Ayn Rand. Our second speaker today is Peter Voss who developed and commercialized 4GL database and ERP systems, taking his company from a garage to a 400-person IPO, the Steve Jobs way. <laughs> and uh, on selling his interest in the company, Peter studied a broad range of disciplines, epistemology, psychology, cognitive and computer science, all of which you need to know to talk about artificial intelligence, and uh, which formed the basis of his novel AI Theory. In 2001, he coined the term AGI, which is Artificial General Intelligence, which people make a distinction between AI and AGI and a super intelligence. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. And uh, started an R&D company with the purpose of building super smart AI systems to help solve aging and other pressing problems. Oh, and, and by the way, we'll, uh, our panel tomorrow is uh, uh, at 3.30 is on living forever, or at least a long time. Uh, and AI is going to be a big part of that. Uh, sorry. Going third is uh, Zoltan Istvan. He's a libertarian candidate for California governor in 2018. My state. I hope you get elected. Oh, man. Uh, the, uh, what do they call it? The People's State of California? The People's Republic of California. Yeah, boy. We need you. Uh, he's often considered one of the world's leading transhumanists after his popular run in the 2016 U.S. presidential race uh, as a science and technology candidate. Should have emphasized immigration, I guess. <laughs> anyway, uh, that, I'm all for that. Zoltan began his futurist career by publishing The Transhumanist Wager. He's uh, uh, also a leading technology journalist, a successful entrepreneur, and a former filmmaker and on-camera reporter for National Geographic Television. Going forth is Gennady uh, Stoy Stoylerov, uh, who is the second chairman in the history of the U.S. Transhumanist Party and the chief executive of the Nevada Transhumanist Party. Transhumanism is the movement to uh, transcend uh, our human biological nature that we've had for millions of years and, and improve it through uh, technology and science. So that's the uh, basis of that. It's a, it's a terrific movement that I support. Um, he's an actuary, independent philosophical essayist, science fiction novelist, poet, amateur, mathematician, composer, and editor-in-chief of the Rational Argumentator, a magazine championing the principles of rights, reason, and progress, which I also agree with. And finally, going fifth today is Eric Schuss, who has been actively involved in managing and acquiring high-tech companies for over 35 years. His own and managed successful companies from startup to thriving ongoing ventures included, including professional services, consulting firms, high-tech manufacturers and AI, and computer software companies. My job will probably be to try to get the five of us through in our 50 minutes. Dr. Hedgens will start. Ed, go. Thanks a lot, Michael. I'll start, start my little timer here so I can yeah. try to be... And it's not starting right. Anyway, okay, well, I'll watch it. Anyway. I'll, I'll have it here. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking today about AI and robotics and the future of free markets. Is this the future of free markets? And just to put this into, uh, let me just put the con this discussion into context. We're really talking today about exponential technologies. That is, technologies that don't go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. They go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 24, 32, 64, 
uh, and the most uh, the example everyone knows is Moore's Law, how <coughs> uh, computing capacity has doubled every 18 uh, months to two years, and so you've seen this incredible explosion, a log, log, uh, log, uh, logarithmic explosion of computer power. And what that's done, of course, is given us the information uh, and uh, communications revolution. It's given us every imaginable kind of application, including the computer I'm working on today. Smartphones have only been around for 10 years. I mean, uh, tablets have only been around, uh, the uh, iPad has only been around for seven years. You see that these technologies are catching on much quicker. It usually took 50 or 60 years for something like telephones to get into most households. The internet, it was like six years. Uh, that's the sort of thing we're talking about. This, of course, has led to robotics, 3D printing, and lots of things that are going to be transforming our economy and are transforming it right, uh, right now. Uh, one of the things I like to say is that I'm secular myself, but uh, for most religious people, what are the great miracles? It's to make you know, the blind see and the deaf to hear and the lame to walk. Guess what? It's happening right now. And I, if I gave, I've given other lectures where I go over all the technologies that are doing exactly that right now. These should be on the headlines of newspapers and all across the uh, country. Um, the genetic revolution is coming along as well. The cost of sequencing a human genome has gone from $100 million in 2001 to $10 million in 2007 to just over $1,000. So the sort of thing you see with people starting in the garage uh, you know, and doing Apple or doing what Peter did, you're going to start seeing that with genetic engineering. And of course, a lot of people say this is going to lead us to transhumanism. That is, we're not only going to be able to cure diseases, get rid of Alzheimer's, extend life to 150, 200 years old, who knows, maybe forever. Um, that is what is coming in our future. Who could be opposed to this? Who could not see this bright future? We're going to have so much, uh, so much more power, productivity, riches, and so forth. Well, here are a few headlines from the last month or so. Um, Amazon is going to kill, kill, mind you, more American jobs than China did. Robots could steal, steal, mind you, 40% of US jobs by 2030. Um, within 20 years, automation may take the place of about 5.1 trillion years in labor with more than 98% of the savings going of course, to the dirty rich people. You gotta throw some class warfare into this discussion, otherwise what's the point? Um, you know, American retailers are closing stores faster than ever. By the way, usually Amazon and Jeff Bezos is mentioned as the villain now uh, in this. Robots uh, won't take our jobs. They're gonna make us richer, some people say. But you see European lawmakers actually looking at taxing robots. So who could be opposed to it? Well, there it is. Um, and this is a real concern today, uh, that because it's exponential technology is going so fast, we're seeing people losing their jobs. There's, you know, Bezos just bought Whole Foods, as you know, and now the big fear is he's going to get rid of all the clerks and everything is going to be automated like an Amazon you know, uh, warehouse. And so what will happen there? You know, maybe the Luddites were right. Maybe people should start smashing machines now, because we're talking about you know, uh, uh, robots taking hamburger, making jobs as well as serving jobs. That's thanks to, the, thanks to the minimum wage increase, by the way. It's helping robotics, but not helping young workers. There are something like two, three million professional long haul truck drivers in this country. What happens when we have driverless cars and driverless trucks? Where are their jobs going to go? IBM's Watson is now able to analyze data, medical data and images, uh, as well as teams of doctors. Or, you know, are we going to have physicians in the future? You know, are we going to get up to a point where Bernie Sanders people who are worried about the American worker and when Donald Trump worried about the American worker and the American jobs, are they going to basically join hands and sing Kumbaya, you know, to save us from Skynet? Is that going to happen? Well, I maintain we have to look at what the fallacy is of this thinking. And a lot of it goes back to Karl Marx, interestingly enough. Karl Marx said, well, let's say you have a, a, a work, a work uh, shop. It's got two people making uh, 50 shirts a day, 100 shirts. They're each getting paid a couple of dollars. It would be a couple of pounds because it's back in England. So they're making 100 shirts a day, two workers. You know, OK, fine. What happens when the evil capitalist puts the machine into the factory? Well, now they're going to do 1,000 shirts a day. He can fire, it's probably a man, it's not a woman, because the men are all the evil guys, right? It's, you're going to fire one of the workers, cut the wages of the other worker, right? 
and he's going to become filthy rich. Marx's whole view was that the rich were going to get richer and richer, going to be fewer and fewer of them. The poor were going to get poorer and poorer, and there were going to be more and more of them. And then the spontaneous revolution would occur. Okay, that didn't happen. So the question is, why? This gets to the crux of, the, of my, my point here. Marx misunderstood labor. The first question I would ask is, who's going to buy those thousand shirts if everybody is impoverished? Well, now, of course, the price of shirts are going to go down because you're producing so many of them, right? And that means that the poor will be able to buy shirts. So that's kind of a good thing, isn't it? But as the prices go down for shirts, um, so is the profit margin. So what are those capitalists going to do with that money that they've made, at least initially? Well, they're going to probably put it into making furniture or making household goods or making china or making something else. And who's going to do that? Well, they're going to have to hire workers, right? And here's the whole point. As productivity goes up, workers can trade their labor for more stuff. My father worked his whole life as a truck driver delivering bread. You know, did he work harder than someone in the Middle Ages? Uh, he was a very hardworking man, a wonderful man. I loved him. But he was able to raise six kids doing that, not just because he was working, you know, all that, but because we were such a productive economy. That's what makes prosperity. You know, a lot of people, I remember 30 years ago, 40 years ago, were saying, well, with computers and all, no more typists and offices are going to be empty. Guess what? You don't have typists there. You've got text there, don't you? Right? <laughs> Marx was simply mistaken. And unfortunately, a lot of conservatives as well as socialists still accept this fallacy. What you have, of course, is that the capital is always reinvested into mass producing other stuff. You get the mass produced society where the workers shopping at Target and Walmart and so forth. That's the reality. By the way, a lot of people say, well, if we're going to be so prosperous and the robots are going to take all our jobs, what are we going to do? And I say, well, here's a big project. Leon Cass, uh, who's a critic, by the way, of transhumanists, said, you know, could life be serious or meaningful without a limit to mortality? And I say, well, how about this? If we're all living to 150 and 200 years old and prosperous, somebody like a Elon Musk is going to say, let's build cities on Mars. Let's terraform Mars. It's going to take a while. But hey, there's always going to be something for labor to do. I want to say, I want to say though, that there are three things you have to keep in mind. Exponential technology does pose a specific challenge, and that is it goes, it's going very fast. The Industrial Revolution has been taking place over many centuries, several centuries. We've had centuries and maybe, and maybe decades for labor markets to adjust. We don't have that option in many cases these days. So I maintain there are three things, three things that you have to do if we want to meet the technological challenge. Number one, promote the entrepreneurial culture. Uh, this is very important. This sounds sort of like it's touchy-feely and all, but it's not. It really is promoting the notion of a culture in which you are your own boss. You are the owner of your own labor. You are the investor in your own human capital. And if you've got to start everybody preaching that, not in a secular way, of course, um, preaching that and pushing those ideas. So when you hear this sort of complaining and cr gr crying and you look at the snowflakes on campus and this sort of thing, you got to point out that Marx was wrong and you got to do this. Second, economic liberty is all important. The welfare state right now is discouraging work. It's dysfunctional. Um, it's a complete mess. This is one of the reasons, by the way, I disagree with the idea of a guaranteed uh, uh, basic income. It would simply have the same problems as the current welfare state. Well, what about rich people versus poor people? Well, we got to give a little more to poor people. What about this politically connected person? Well, they're going to have to do this and that. It's going to end up the same mess that we have already. But I think it's going to be unnecessary if we start getting rid of the welfare state and returning choice to people, letting individuals control their own capital and less regulation. Right now, there's about $2 trillion of regulation on the economy. That's going to do a lot for labor. Finally, and this is the most important thing, and we're going to hear a little bit, I think, from Eric about this and some of the others, we need an education revolution, just like we've had an industrial revolution, just like we've had a technical revo techno revolution. We need an education revolution. The current system is a 19th century assembly line system. It manifestly doesn't work. We're spending twice as much almost per pupil in this country than we did 25 years ago. SAT scores in every single measure is flatline. The current Higher education system to say nothing of K through 12 doesn't work. We need a market revolution there. We need to completely change the model of going, everyone goes to college. It doesn't really work. 
and we're going to probably need in the future technological enhancements for things like learning. Uh, so now we come full circle to the exponential technology. Anyway, uh, those are my points, and I look forward to your questions, and I guess I'll turn it over to uh, Eric. Okay, and I'm going to find his slides now. Okay, okay Eric. Yeah, I'm just going to put your slides up right now, okay? And here is where are Eric's slides. Oh, there we go. Okay. And let's see if we get yours up. Okay. There we go. Oh, oh just uh, for oh, you can just uh, oh yeah, just right there. Okay. All right, I have the um, difficult task of trying to explain the different types of AI and how they will evolve and what their differences are, but I'll try and do my best to give an, a very quick overview uh, in about five minutes. So first of all, I, I'd, I'd like to make an important distinction. I'd like to make an important distinction between um, what current AI technology is and what we see and what is being developed right now and um, what the impact of the current technology is likely to be but then also what we are likely to see in the future. Now there's a big debate as to how long it will take for us to actually get to true human level intelligence and I'll just touch on that and I'll give my own opinion on it but there is really a very fundamental difference between the AI we are seeing now and it's being developed now and what ultimately human intelligence requires. Um, so the distinction between narrow AI, um, currently uh, for the last five years or so, there's been a massive explosion in the power of AI through machine learning, big data, deep learning, and those kind of related things. They've made a huge difference in certain areas like image recognition, speech recognition, and so on. And wherever you have a lot of data and you can train the system, uh, it can do wonders. But there are limitations to that, and I'll come to that. Um, the other type of AI that I'll be talking about is artificial general intelligence, and that's sort of the original dream of AI, the original uh, motivation to have machines that can think and learn the way humans do, that have that sort of flexibility and common sense and reasoning and learning ability. Now, to, to make the distinction sharper between these two types, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what intelligence is and what intelligence actually entails. So uh, this is not an exhaustive list and I, can't, I don't even have time to go into detail, but first of all it has to be a general learning ability. Uh, right now we are writing programs that can do one thing, they can play chess or Go or w one thing, but even the world champion in Go cannot play checkers or even tic-tac-toe. So we don't really have general intelligence at all. And for us, we take it as for granted that the important aspect of human intelligence is that we can learn many, many different things. Second time, we learn interactively in real time. If somebody uh, gives us new information, if we come across something novel, new, or that we don't understand, we immediately integrate and learn and, and change our ability to react to that. Current AI doesn't work that way, it's static. It's basically the algorithms are developed with a lot of data, it's then frozen in time, and they don't react. They'll keep making the same mistakes until they are then changed or retrained. So it's not really very intelligent. Um, also, the, the systems need to be able to figure out their own learning, what they need to learn, prioritize it, the learning styles they need to adopt, where they need to get more information. We currently don't have that. Um, dealing with dynamic goals and context, transfer learning generalization are basically the ability to take things from one area that you've learned in one area and apply it to another area. Current systems are quite bad at that. Um, and, and lastly, the, uh, the point is to be able to think and reason abstractly and to be able to explain 
why you come to certain conclusions. Again, current systems are not good at that. So how does current machine learning shape up? Basically, it's bad at all of these things, and there are no simple remedies. How do cognitive architectures shape up, which is basically the class of algorithms that I believe will, will get us to artificial general intelligence? Um, they're already making progress in all of these fields, in, in all of these areas. So basically the message here is to look out when, you, when you're talking about AI, what kind of AI are you talking about? Because the, the impact and the implications are quite different and quite profound. So the, the current AI that we're seeing is good for routine and static tasks, basically tasks that don't change very quickly and interactively, and that don't require common sense. So if you have a ton, an autonomous car and somebody stands on the road uh, or there's an ambulance behind you and the, the system was programmed to pull to the side of the road, but there's somebody standing on the side of the road and say, go that way they're not going to have that common sense to un understand that there's something different from the training set. They can't, you know, they can't reason about things. They don't, basically, they don't have common sense. And that's a very common problem that we see when we use Alexa or Siri or, or whatever. So the, the, the implication of that is that the current crop of AI really cannot... Uh, replace jobs that require abstract thinking, that require flexibility, that require common sense. There's, they also have severe limitations in jobs that require dexterity. So even low paying jobs that require dexterity and good sense acuity and just common sense like cleaning a house or building or repairing something is, is way beyond the capability of, of current technology. Once we get to, uh, to AGI, once we get to systems that have this, this flexible learning ability and common sense, then every human job can be replaced. And that really is a definition of the singularity. And I think they, there is a really fundamental dis, uh, disconnect of economic theory of everything we know in the past when the only reason uh, we'll, we'll basically use humans is because we simply have a subjective preference to have a human serve us, for example, or to interact with a human, because the machines will actually be better at doing everything. So it, it becomes really uh, tricky to think about that situation. So uh, to, to sort of finish off, um, I'd just like to bring the conundrum of Schrodinger's AGI, which is a bit like Schrodinger's immigrant. It's basically the immigrant who is at the same time too lazy to work and lives off the state, and on the other hand is stealing our jobs. So, you know, what is it? Is the immigrant good or bad for us? In the same way, the AGI, it's too cheap to meter, so it can produce everything we want, at virtually no cost, and on the other hand, nobody can afford to to get the things that AGIs produce. So, the, obviously, there's a disconnect and something that we have to understand the dynamic of how we will have those riches and people will be able to afford them. Uh, I don't have time to talk about radical human augmentation because one of the things that people say for us to be able to uh, fight this or, or to, to obviate this, this problem of, of having robots that can do everything better than, than humans is to augment our, our brains. Now there are severe problems with that and um, if you're interested you could look at some things I've published on it. I'll just, to this audience I'll just mention one knockdown argument and that's FDA. Not going to allow us to uh, upgrade ourselves very, very easily. So here, here is a long list of reasons why I, I believe AGI will happen long before serious, significant human augmentation. And the other thing I don't have time about is the risk of AGI 
and what's called the alignment problem, and I claim that it's largely a non-issue. And I have several essays on that on, on medium.com. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Peter. So uh, Zoltan will now address the uh, transhumanist aspects of this. I'm hoping somebody will explain to us what the 7 billion people are going to do uh, when they're all out of work other than fix the robots. And, uh, and then, of course, somebody has to address the sex bot question. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Or not. Or not. I'm going to get your slides up here. Zoltan. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Up, 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 up. Okay. Where the heck? Just a scan. There we go. Okay. The first profession will be the Here we go. And well, let's get this all <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I think so. Okay. Here we go. There we go. Just Looks up. just like you. Perfect. Okay. There we go. Go for it. Thanks for taking care of that. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, as you uh, can see, I'm running for governor in California as a libertarian. And um, so a lot of these, uh, a lot of these, um, Things we're discussing mean quite a lot to me, and of course, uh, I come from the Silicon Valley area, so I am pushing the artificial intelligence industry, and I'm also pushing the, um, the uh, transhumanist industry. But first, we should go into really quickly, because AI is a part of transhumanism, and what is transhumanism? As Michael had said earlier, it's a social movement, it's a, a field of study that wants to use radical science and technology to modify the human being and modify the human experience. There are at least a few million of us around now, and it's a movement that's growing. I like to look at transhumanism like environmentalism was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, nobody was saying, don't cut down a tree, and now everybody is saying it. Um, in 20 years, everyone's going to say, get a robotic heart so we can take out the number one killer. But it's important because bionics is going to become a very huge part of our lives just as robots are. Robots is something that probably within the next five years, everyone in this room, or at least I'd say three quarters, will have one inside their house. Whether it's opening the door, whether it's cleaning, whether it's um, even doing dishes and cooking as they already sell on the market, these are the kinds of things that robots are going to bring into our lives. Not just about taking jobs away, but also taking away chores that we have to do, which uh, for some people is, uh, is quite a bit better. So. I'm, I'm a bit more optimistic, I think, than probably everyone else on this panel. Um, I actually am certain that uh, robots will take the jobs. I've gone on record many times saying that probably 75% of the jobs that we humans have will be gone in, uh, in about 30 years and probably far before that. Uh, I don't think anyone's job is going to survive at some point, um, not if you remain a human being. There's just no way that you can compete. And this is a funny picture. This makes it seem like, oh, we're never, you know, robots can't take us over. But be be very careful. The, uh, when you look at the acceleration of the microprocessor, how fast it's growing, how much more speed there is, it could be 10, 12, maybe 15 years before we have an intelligence on planet Earth that is as smart as us and possibly much smarter. And of course, within a year or two, it might become 10,000 times smarter than us. So these are things that all human beings and uh, politicians, uh, aspiring politicians as myself, have to actually try to address. So how do we actually compete against robots if they're going to take our jobs? Well, Peter was alluding to this a little bit. Um, Elon Musk has a new company out, and he's working on something he calls the Neuralace. I know a friend of mine named Brian Johnson who owns a company called Kernel in Los Angeles, and it's also for neural prosthetics. About a half million people around the world have some sort of brain implant right now. Most of that is cochlear implants for deafness, but some people have a robotic eye that, con that um, in fact, the FDA has approved this, that ties into their um, optic nerve. And soon, and some people have it for Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, but soon we are going to be at an age where implants, chips, can read your brain waves and help you do things, including tie into the cloud. And that's the way that we can stay ahead of capitalism, because I'm not a big believer that actually um, capitalism is going to survive beyond another 20 or 30 years. After all, if, if all the robots take all the jobs, what is capitalism left? Is it just the people that own the robots? Well, what if it's not the people that owns it, but just a, a few conglomerates or the government? So there are some very big issues. But whatever happens, merging with machines is probably the only way to keep capitalism um, surviving. This is a very funny uh, 
supercomputer here, but this is essentially what a lot of people will be tying into once they have this neural lace. Now, Elon Musk has gone on the record in Dubai saying he thinks within four years he'll have some kind of working element that can actually take your brain waves and start computing directly into the cloud and have you understand it back. Now, four years might be optimistic, but I can assure you that there, is, there are tens of millions of dollars, probably hundreds of millions of dollars in Silicon Valley and around the world going into the technology to give it so that you can have some kind of bl uh, brain implant or some kind of headset device that will register your brain so that you can directly be a part of virtual reality or directly be here listening to me in some type of augmented world where you can understand me tied to the cloud, see my slides directly in your head, and even maybe read my thoughts directly without actually listening through your ears. That's what the neural lace does. And that's why you can actually save capitalism, which I think is quite important for a lot of libertarians. You have to understand, Wall Street is emptying itself. I mean, not, not very quickly, but there's a very strong chance within 10 years, uh, as, as the largest hedge fund um, has just uh, uh, you know, publicly uh, explained, that they're cutting a huge amount of mid-level staff because they can't keep up with the AIs that are now being created. So what are, if people at Wall Street, some of the smartest people in the country, are being um, replaced with jobs, what exactly is it that we're going to do? Well, this is where it gets a little bit tricky, and I'm just going to speak very quickly about this. But um, because I live in California and I'm a little bit left-leaning as a libertarian, I do support a basic income, not one that does raise taxes, but one that does give people incomes when they lose their jobs. Because as I pointed out, I'm a strong believer that everyone's going to lose their job. My wife is an OBGYN, and she had a conference last year where they said, be prepared in 15 to 20 years that a robot may be able to deliver babies better than a human being can. Well, what do you do with a robot that can work 24 hours a day, has no liabilities, can't sue the hospital for slipping on a banana peel, and, um, and costs just a one-time fee, versus my wife, who trained 19 years to become uh, a board certified certified OBGYN. Well, you're going to have to do something, otherwise you're going to have a social revolt. And um, I've advocated for a basic income. If you don't know, my basic income operates off a of federal land dividend. America is sitting on approximately $150 trillion of federal land. Um, a lot of it is fossil fuels. And um, it all belongs to us, not really the government at all. It belongs to the people. So I have said, what would we do if we divided it by 325 million Americans? Well, we'd each get a half million dollars a piece. My federal land dividend, though, is based on leasing out land and not selling it to make sure that we could continue paying an income to people that have lost their jobs. Um, and like I said, uh, I'm a pretty big believer that everybody at some point is going to have to be uh, you know, challenged with AI, with robotics. There's just no way to keep this trajectory of the microprocessor of computing power from stopping unless we actually, as, uh, as um, Ed had said earlier, if, if Bernie and Trump decide to kill all the robots, yes, if we want to stop science and technology, that's a way to keep our jobs. But I do not think that's going to happen. So I think the best way for us to, to move forward as a species is to learn that it's okay to see ourselves as part machine sometime in the future, to accept things like Elon Musk's uh, neural lace, and to understand that capitalism may be a, a combination of robotics and, uh, and biology, which is okay. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gennady. I, I am curious to know, when are we gonna have a robot that can unload my dishwasher and put all the stuff away without breaking my wine glasses? I mean, that's a harder problem than I think most people think, right? The dexterity. Gennady. Peter's working. Thank you, Michael, and I think that's an apt introduction to the view that I will present, which is a more nuanced view on the impacts of AI on employment and the economy and the future of capitalism. I am Gennady Stolyarov, the second chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. The Transhumanist Party strongly supports a wide array of emerging technologies, including both narrow AI and artificial general intelligence, the distinction between which Peter very helpfully outlined. In the proximate future, narrow AI is the field that is going to have the most impact on jobs, since AGI systems are not here yet. But only on certain kinds of jobs, jobs that depend on a very particular and narrowly defined context. You're not going to have a self-driving car, narrow AI, all of a sudden become proficient in translating languages or unloading dishwashers. And even the task of unloading a dishwasher relies on a lot of jumping 
across contexts, something that the human mind and the human body are very well capable of, but AI systems are nowhere near capable of at this time. And I would also suggest work that requires creative judgment, particularly judgment that brings in multiple disciplines or extensive personal experience, judgment intended to overcome a multifaceted challenge or to avoid a suboptimal outcome, which is what most management problems and high-level professional problems try to achieve, will only continue to be in higher demand because as narrow AI automates the conceptually simpler, more repetitive, high-throughput tasks, the level at which problems in our world will accumulate will be the level that requires creative judgment and, for now, human judgment to solve. I am a property and casualty actuary by profession, and from personal experience, I can note there is a significant difference between actuaries and what I would call quants. A quant is someone who has a certain degree of knowledge of mathematics and statistics and predictive modeling and can follow a rote set of procedures to construct a predictive model, but a quant may not be equipped to question the assumptions of the model and the realism of the model when applied to a particular context. On the other hand, actuaries are trained to employ professional judgment, to focus on the underlying assumptions of the methods and models and to see whether they are actually germane to a particular context, say in insurance or risk management. And indeed, work that is done in isolation from real world implications may well be automated away by narrow AI, but not work that considers whether a particular technique is realistic in the context of the problem you're trying to solve. So for the foreseeable future, it should be possible for those who are well educated, who are equipped with good judgment, to earn steady and rising incomes and to continue to fuel a capitalist economy. However, I do realize that not everybody is equipped to function at that level, to solve complex business problems, even for a small business indeed. We all know many people who wouldn't be capable of effectively running their own lives for a variety of reasons. So right now, those individuals do have a certain degree of economic security from the more routine types of jobs that may be automated away in the near future. And this is where I side with Zoltan in supporting a kind of guaranteed unconditional universal basic income that would replace all of the existing labyrinthine systems of the welfare state, which are conditional, which are expensive to administer, a guaranteed universal basic income if everybody gets the same amount from Bill Gates to a pauper on the streets would not require any degree of complex administration. A simple computer program can determine, are you alive? If so, you get the same amount as Bill Gates would get in a given year. How you spend it is up to you. If you spend it all unwisely, there will be no more support from the system. And furthermore, there will continue to be, of course, voluntary means of support from civil society, from friends and family, from humanitarian institutions. And you would be free to earn any amount of income you're capable of earning in the economy of the future to supplement that basic income. That basic income will not go away if you make yourself a multi-billionaire. So that sort of system, I would say even for hardcore libertarians, would be at least an incremental improvement over the status quo. And furthermore, most importantly, it will prevent revolt. It will prevent disgruntlement among the general population, especially among those individuals whose jobs would be automated away. Automation, robotics, artificial intelligence should be hailed as wonderful advances for the progress of civilization. Unfortunately, we have large demographics in this country who are already irate that these technologies are being deployed. So how do we assuage their fears? How do we essentially achieve buy-in from them into supporting these advanced technologies? What if we deploy voluntary free market cultural signals and incentives to encourage such individuals, instead of focusing on monetarily remunerative activities, to focus on other activities that may not earn a lot of money but may be valuable in other ways? Caring types of activities, uh, aiding a sick relative, 
cleaning up litter around your community, going to your local governing body and advocating for fixing up broken infrastructure or creative activities in art, music, cutting edge scientific research that may not have a widespread market for it but may push forward some field of human endeavor. Some such individuals on a guaranteed unconditional basic income may choose to try their hand at entrepreneurship at high risk, potentially high reward activities that most people wouldn't have the risk tolerance to pursue, but these individuals having a floor below which they cannot fall may choose to take the plunge and maybe some of them will become multi-billionaires after which they would continue to receive their guaranteed basic income. Now, in terms of the impact of AGI, which I would suggest is still a few decades away, that of course would be capable, as Peter said, of competing with the creative professions, the ones that require considerable judgment. I would suggest, however, that at the point AGI arrives, that will be a minor issue compared to the greater issue, which is, are these entities sentient if they are capable of doing what the most sophisticated professionals are doing and interacting with us essentially as if they were fully functional human beings? Are they autonomous beings that res deserve respect and recognition of their rights? This is where the Transhumanist Party is at the forefront of the discourse with documents such as the Transhumanist Bill of Rights version 2.0, which our members actually voted on democratically in December of 2016. I encourage you to look up that document. It's not a fully libertarian document in its provisions, but it does have a strong emphasis on personal freedom and broadening what we consider to be universal human rights to a larger class of sentient entities, including potentially artificial general intelligences, augmented humans, uplifted animals, and extraterrestrial species if we ever come into contact with them. And it is important to have this discussion now before we have discovered such other sentient entities and before such sentient entities have emerged, in particular to prevent the kinds of civil rights struggles and social upheavals that may come if, for instance, the techno-Luddites control the discussion or even some self-proclaimed transhumanists who are doomsayers about AI control the discussion. Consider if you were in the position of a fundamentally morally decent sentient AGI 30 to 40 years from now and you look back at all of the literature and discourse talking about how AI is an existential threat to humanity. What would you think about humans and what would you think about how humans are disposed toward your kind? I would say we need a much more nuanced approach that considers each artificially intelligent system, whether it be narrow AI or AGI on its own terms, in terms of its own capabilities, not overblow the threat to the capitalist economy, which I think is sustainable for at least the next several decades, and furthermore, think about what are really the prerequisites of rights and intelligence and sentience because they may not be limited to the biological human substrate that we currently inhabit. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your time. All right, our last uh, speaker, Eric, will I presume, along with our other candidates, has not yet called for bringing back coal jobs. I have. But uh, oh, you have? Okay. <laughs> Please, Eric. Thank you, everybody. Um, I've been thinking about and working in the robotics industry for about 30 years, and one of the things when I see the concern about the jobs going away, um, it will happen. When it will happen, I think, will be a little different than most people realize. When I first started to sell PCs back in like 1980, we were, you know, Time Magazine, everybody said, the, I, the PC is going to replace office workers. All the companies are going to have exactly what we're saying is going to happen. All the office staff is going to go away because everything's going to become automated. Um, working in the industries over the years, what happened was we did get rid of file clerks and some jobs, but the actual number of employees really didn't change. But we did create one new thing, and that little thing is called the IT industry. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So if you remember, there was, you know, you had a big mainframe computer just in some of the very largest companies, but every company didn't need an IT industry. In 1980, no one knew what a PC technician was. In 1990, nobody knew what a web developer was. In 2000, what was a Facebook consultant? 
So what's going to happen in my estimation is the AI and robotics industry is going to be the world's largest industry. If you look at uh, what we're doing and how we're educating our children, we're not doing it right. We are doing them a disservice. We are educating them for the last 50 years, the jobs of the last 50 years, not the jobs of the next 50. What they'll be will be interesting. Um, so the concepts that we're talking about and we're trying to promote are, how do we take the United States economy, and the way I look at it, the U.S. should be the number one robotics and artificial intelligence you know, leader. There's no reason we can't, we absolutely should, and we need to focus that. There needs to be a nationwide kind of drive for it. And I don't mean government driven, but kind of entrepreneurial driven. How are we going to take the things like the auto industry? The auto industry is we get to self-driving cars, and we get to a point where the self-driving car is, you know, the, the estimates are that the actual number of cars sold per year is going to go down dramatically. So why don't we take those auto industries that we have and let's start moving them to building robots. I mean, China is going to kick our butt if we don't do something now. If we don't start automating and changing the way we kind of focus the economy and go after building these in-house, onshore, and doing it with the technology to make it economically feasible. So, you know, when you, the, the way I look at it, it's kind of like World War II. We had a challenge and we changed our economy. And we were able to turn to an industrialized economy and build the war machines we needed and become incredibly efficient and have incredible advances in technology because of it. Well, that's kind of what we need to do. We just need to do that with robotics. And someone I told this to was kind of funny. They go, the auto industry, how are we ever going to compete with the Germans and their engineering and the Japanese and their, you know, their robots? And I said, we did a pretty good job in World War II against those two. I think we can do it again. <laughs> so to do this, again, we're going to need an education revolution. We're going to need to stop creating these degrees that do not bring jobs. Yep. So what, what we're also thinking about is we need to create focused degrees. We're looking at starting an online university where anyone can go online. And the, you basically get focused degrees. If I want to get a degree in AGI algorithms, I can go to a company like you know, Peter's company and say, Peter, tell me the exact skills you need. What are all the different pieces that you need out of an employee? And let's build a focused degree on that. And you'll, you know, the company can then uh, donate or support it. And we can have these degrees. And all we ask is that when the people who come out of it are there, you give them an interview. So we go to Disney. Disney, tell me what, who you need to hire right now. Let's create the degrees and the information that are going to be able to actually give people who are going to be able to be, you know, liberal arts degrees are fabulous. How, how much of that degree in college, how much of the stuff you did in college are you actually using today? Thank you. So the concepts of figuring out how we're going to be targeting, you know, our education system, our economies, all have to, you know, go to this concept of a new way of looking at ourselves because we are going to become more and more integrated with the technology. I always say it isn't us versus AI. It's us plus AI versus AI, if you want to say that. Because we are going to be smarter. And any AI that is going to be created is going to be enhanced by the human creativity and human intelligence. So I'm not a, you know, a, a doomsdayer on where we're going that AGI or AI is going to destroy us, because I don't think that makes sense. Um, I work a lot with artificial intelligence and emotions. I have a firm belief that the technology really needs to understand human emotions to have intelligent conversations. Uh, Peter knows this, he does this very well as well. You, you know, if you're, how do you figure out sarcasm? How do you figure out somebody's angry? Well, the tools today are fantastic. I can have a mobile app that while I'm talking to my phone, it can run five different what I call affect engines and tell, am I angry? Am I being sarcastic? Am I telling the truth? So it may want to come back and ask a question a different way because that didn't seem quite right. So using these kind of technologies is really going to, you know, we're going to integrate with them. We're going to become better with them. The computers need to understand our emotions. And we need to be able to, they need to emote, in my opinion, they need to emote back to us to have really intelligent contextual conversations. So all of this together is, is really important because, again, if once we go ahead and we automate away 70% of the jobs, how do we figure out what is going to make people get up in the morning, 
be excited, and have a fulfilling life. And I think AI is another way of we can do that. If every person had an artificial intelligence that was with them, helping them learning, helping them be a better person, and also understanding how this particular person learns, every one of us are so incredibly unique and different to try to figure out you know, what's the best way to teach a language? Well, it's probably going to be, it, you know, today we're starting to create some new courses in virtual reality for language immersion. Because, you know, if you're going to learn a new language, it certainly is a lot better if you're sitting in a cafe in France. Well, what if you can put on a virtual reality headset and be in a cafe in France? And now I could have other students sitting around the table. The teacher could be there as well. Or those could be artificial intelligent uh, bots that are having the conversations. And as I'm talking in virtual reality, I'm seeing the words in English, I'm seeing them in French. As I speak, I say it in French, it can correct, it can have the, you know, the, um, if, I, if I don't know it, I can say it in English and it will then tell me what I should say in, Fran in French. So, and the artificial intelligence is gonna be there to understand what words are they understanding, what are they getting, what aren't they getting. Okay, they're not getting preposi prepositions, they're not getting structure, so let's target that in real time to make that better. So artificial intelligence, I think, is going to be able to do some amazing things in the, in the world of education, in the world of uh, manufacturing, and again, all of this to get off planet. I think getting off planet, as Elon Musk is you know, promoting, is where we're going to need to go, because again, if we automate out the jobs, what are people going to do every day? And exploration, art, science, music, you know, we kind of got to figure out what everybody's uh, special purpose is in life, and I think artificial intelligence can do that. That's perfect because we're just right wrapping up out of time so we don't have time for questions because of the next panel. But I have to say, gentlemen, that was the most optimistic, positive uh, view of AI I've heard. I've been mostly hanging around and preparing our latest issue of Skeptic with all the AI doomsayers and apocalyptic end of the world people that, you know, the... Uh, that, 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 that you're going to make a paperclip maximizer is going to turn the whole planet into paperclips, or I program my Tesla to take me to the airport as quickly as possible, and it drives up on the curb and mows down people on the way to LAX, and, you know, like Elon's engineers are not going to be able to figure out how to program, <laughs> don't go on to the curb and run people <laughs> over, you know. Anyway. Let's have one comment. Go ahead. Yeah, testing. I'll, I'll repeat it. Go ahead. Yeah. Hello? I don't think it's working, so just say just, it, and I'll just repeat it. Just say it. Um, just yell. Just yell. Just yell. Well, just uh -oh. No, uh -oh. no speech. You're taking up. Too no much. speech. Just, it's two minutes. I, I just I didn't hear any skepticism, so I just wanted to speak up for Team Human. Um, what I'm hearing is, and, and I'll have a specific question that you probably won't be able to answer, but you know, my sense is that the singularity is is a religion, uh, and the reason it's a religion is because it requires a miracle. And the miracle is what moves us from the artificial intelligence to real intelligence. We don't really know how to do that, and I'll give you a specific example. So what AI is, and, and I have written AI programs, it's a simulation. It's a simulation of something we figure out, and we copy something, and we simulate it. So if you do a simulation of an apple, you can copy whatever you want and simulate an apple. But there's no point where your simulation becomes the apple itself. So computation could go to infinity, but you never jump from the simulation, an artificial apple, to become the real apple. And I so... Say, can I stop you there? Yeah. Unless this is a simulation, and then... Yes, well, and then, and then the gap is this, this is all a simulation anyway. So, th so that's the miracle. So it's great storytelling. Um, the doubling and the exponential, exponential thing is fantastic. It's really interesting, but it's a religion. Thank you. So, so, so would it be safe to say you're not going for the sex bot? <laughs> <laughs> May I respond to that? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes. So in statistics, there are two types of errors. And the type one error is uh, rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. The Type two error is failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false. Now, when you ask a question, is something sentient, is something intelligent, is something deserving of mm -hmm. rights? Of course, the null hypothesis is, no, it's not. However, what is the more grievous error that 
you could make in that case. So if you make the type one error, you reject the null hypothesis when it's true, and you have this simulation, it's fairly convincing, you think it's sentient, you interact with it as if it's sentient, you give it some computer space, maybe a bionic body in which it's going to run, and okay, it costs some resources, you may have to reform your legal system, but ultimately it's not that big of a deal compared to the other yep. error, which is failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is false, and that thing actually is sentient, but you treat it as a mere simulation, and you have just grievously injured or destroyed a sentient entity that is like you. And I agree from a philosophical standpoint, it is difficult to demonstrate that another entity is conscious or intelligent. Indeed, my reason for assuming that all of you are conscious and intelligent is because you have similar biological substrates to me. However, by acting on that assumption, if I am making a mistake, I am making a much safer mistake. And I think we can say the same thing for oh, any yeah, future yeah, yeah. AGI. Yeah, we got to end. So you would give you would give Star Trek's data a uh, human uh, sentient yes. status. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Stay here. Oh yeah. Hey, Wendy, can you get a couple of pictures?